Jim. I just had a good talk yeah. with him. Fine. Have you got him uh, positioned properly? Is he, uh, I think, I think he, he is. He what, uh, what, has what, he talked yet to uh, Baker? No, he hasn't. Uh, he called Sam Irvin and offered to come visit with both he and Baker. And uh, that was done last week. And he thought the timing would be bad to call Baker prior to the joint meeting. So he says, after I have that joint meeting, I'll start working my relationship with Baker. Well, Baker left with me that he was going to set up a joint meeting. I see. So Heidi has talked to, uh, uh, he has talked to Irvin, and Irvin said, yes, Irvin just left it dangling and said, I'll be back in touch with you. I think what, what disturbs me a little bit about Baker was his move to put his own man in as minority counsel so quickly, without any consultation, as he had promised consultation. And I'm told this man may be a disaster in himself, a minority counsel. He is. What do you need to say? Well, he's, uh, well, I can't knock age. He's 30, he's 30 years of age. He doesn't know a thing about Washington. So we'll have to wait. Baker, Baker says that he puts the blame on the White House. He says that Carlos has called in and suggested somebody else that is a great mistake. Or I didn't know anything about that. Apparently, well, Baker apparently is quite open in his soliciting. I want to counsel with you all, and I don't want to move until I told you what I'm going to do. And then he did just the reverse. So it was curious, one, that he wanted a meeting with you. Uh, secondly, that uh, he suggested Kleinings as a conduit. That's correct. And there is hope, I think, that uh, he may try to keep an eye on this thing and not let it get into a total circus up there. And Baker, Baker might. Well, that's what he indicated. He indicated, of course, of course, with regard to his uh, situation, his position, now, and with regard to Kleinings' position, I, uh, I should have up a bit. I don't know. Really. Yeah. 
cannot have a stone wall. And so that appears that we're not letting them. And so I think we've got to be in a position to do it. Did you discuss this with Kleinies as to what the position would be on that point? That's, I think, John, is the important thing. The Kleinies has got to stand goddamn firm on I did. I talked to him about that. I said that, uh, one, there's a statement forthcoming. I don't know the timing yeah. on it. Yeah. The present will issue. I said that is fortunate the context it's coming out in because Clark Mullenhoff solicited the statement in a press inventory. It's coming out in an unrelated context and not related to Watergate per right. se. Right. So that'll be out soon, and that will define yeah. what the outer perimeters are. It also gives the... Well, you said that nobody from White House staff will testify for a committee. That's right. Of course, that would help. Well, under normal circumstances, if there's, yeah, a, there's, right. a, that's, there's a little uh, slide in there. And then what, as a practical matter, I told him it probably happen to be much like the Flanagan situation, where there's an exchange, and the, the issues become very narrow as to the information that's sought. Well, you were, uh, you talked to John earlier, but you were in revising that last paragraph. We've done that. You've already worked with this, sir. And, uh, well, after I see this, uh, this cardinal, maybe, maybe about, I think about, we ought to get rid of him in 15, 20 minutes. You might break it down. Uh, you've got it written already, yes, sir. And let me take a look at it again, mm -hmm. and we'll approve the statement. I don't want to put it out right now because I, it depends on what I decide to do. It would probably be easier not to have those questions in your press conference, I, per se. I would prefer, that's what I want to do, is to have this statement come back to the press conference to say, if they ask anything about it, I'm covering up the statement that will be issued tomorrow. It's very complicated. It's very complicated. So, see, that's what I have in mind. I'd rather not be questioned on the statement. Mollenhoff himself will debate you right there on the subject. Right. So I'll say I'm covering it. And I did talk to Mollenhoff yesterday at uh, Ron's request. Well, to look into the case. Told him one look in the case, and I had an extended discussion with him on the executive privilege question. Of course, he differs somewhat from where we're coming out, but he agrees that certainly the president has the legal authority to do that, and he agrees also that it's. Uh, it's well, in his case, what is he talking about? Well, he says he thinks that all White House staff should be ready to run up to the hill and testify, and he asks is what they're doing, and it's the rare exception when the president invokes the privilege. I said, Clark, it's got to be the other way around. Staff can't operate if they're going to be queried on every bit of communication they have with the president. Right. Mansfield himself, the president, has recognized that communications between you and your staff are protected. He said this in a policy statement before they issued this resolution up there on uh, having confirmable individuals agree to testify before they are confirmed. As far as the confirmable individuals are concerned, they're all available for testimony, though. That's right. It's no problem there. There's no we problem there. There's not a giveaway by any means on that. They, of course, will, uh, they, they, they can, I guess, we, we would not normally claim executive privilege or cabinet officer, would we? Uh, no, sir. Only, only if, in, say, the rare instances where we have already, where they're going for information, which should be protected, investigative files, uh, classified material for, say, aid programs or something when we did it in the last, IRS files, those are the instances in which we've done it. Yeah. And they're quite uh, traditional and, and should be expected by the Congress when they go after information like that. I went over to Klein and said this to show you how the worm turns here, what we went through in the his case. There, we were investigating not uh, espionage by a political, one political organization against another, but a charge of espionage against the United States of America, which was a hell of a lot more serious. And in that case, the Department of Justice, the White House, the FBI, totally stonewalled the committee. The FBI would not furnish any information. And here the FBI, I understand, is going to furnish information to this committee. That's so that would be great, perhaps. Right. All right. The Department of Justice refused give us any information at all. And of course, the White House refused. Executive privilege. And the press was all on their side in that case. Did you see that? Was, That's right. That was it. That's for sure. Whose ox is being gored? Now, here you've got so called espionage involving a political organization. And uh, so now they want to. Well, you know, I would. Uh, in in uh, doing some checking. I don't take this. I said that's just a history my whole matter. That's what our Democratic friends did. We were trying to get information. Lyndon Johnson uh, was probably the uh, 
greatest abuser of the FBI, I'm told by people, that some of the old hands over there. Used it for He used it as his personal... Uh, what did he use it against the press? He used it against the, the press. He used it against his own party. Uh, back in 64, when the Walter Jenkins thing broke, uh, he had high officials of the FBI out trying to strong-arm a doctor to say that this man had a brain tumor. Uh, Walter Jenkins. He also then turned his the FBI loose on the Goldwater staff. Uh, this sort of thing is starting to see. Who knows? Is it getting out? Uh, I'm sorry. Well, you know, are still the incident of the famous incident of the buggy bar plane. That's right. Which uh, they really they really know is true. And you know these instances that they talk about about the uh, about our buggy and the FBI stuff. So. Delegates. That's right. 
which is kind of fantastic. Solomon mm-hmm. is a wealth of knowledge, of, uh, and the more I, you know, sort of generally chat with him about these problems, the more it comes out. He's a man that can also document. Why is there a fight to help the state for who to do that? Solomon knows too much. That's right. Uh, Why does Solomon squawk? I think Solomon probably is loyal to the institution. The institution and doesn't want to go there. Is not. Can he help you to find out who the hell is not? Is it the possibility of a guy at Time Magazine's lawyer? You don't think it's him? He speculates, uh, and the speculation generally is, is either Sullivan himself, Mark Felt, who yes, is... I know. The lawyer says that. That's right. Uh, and the other one is a fellow, Tom Bishop, who's now departed, who was in charge of their public information. And well, did he know about these things? Who would he tell people no. about these things? Did he? For example, the 68 thing, I tra- was trying to determine who might know about that. Yeah. Hoover, uh, apparently, Hoover apparently told Pat Coyne, Patrick Coyne, who used to be on the NSC I staff. Know. Is he still living? I don't know. I don't know the man. He told Pat Coyne. He told Pat Coyne. Coyne told Rockefeller. Rockefeller relayed this to Kissinger. This was one channel that might have it in the public domain. The other is when Sullivan took the records, or all the documents in connection with this, uh, out of his office and out of the Bureau. He also instructed the Washington Field Office to destroy all our records, which they did. Uh, Hoover incensed at this, that he couldn't reconstruct, or didn't have the records and couldn't get them from Sullivan, tried to have the Washington Field Office reconstruct them, which they couldn't. As a result of that movement and flailing around by Hoover, a lot of people in the agency were aware of what had happened, and it was on the grapevine. Well, that's when it happened. When Sullivan left, he took the records with him. He took the records with him. And that's the only records there were. That's the only records there were. He did it out of the uh, office uh, uh, over? No. Uh, he was doing it to protect, to protect uh, the Bureau. No, he was doing it to protect the White House and the people over here. Oh, oh but for Christ's sake, Hoover. Well, well, Hoover never got his hands on the records. If what happened, Sullivan had the, Sullivan had his uh, his pissing match with Hoover, and then he, he took them with him at that time. See. And then he turned them over to Marty and ultimately. I see. And so we got. It. And then where is Sullivan? Sullivan is back at Justice in the Drug Intelligence. We Bureau. Are. We do. He wants to go back to the Bureau and work on. Uh, Domestic. Uh, Why is it that Gray is wrong? I think Mark Spelt has poisoned Gray on this issue. And I think once well, Gray is. Hell, somebody's doing Mark Spelt. You know, but do you, do you believe the Tom Magazine lawyer is Spelt up to, Is he capable of this sort of thing? Well, let me tell you where, I, where else I heard that from. Uh, was Sandy Smith uh, had told, not, not the, the lawyer, but somebody else that felt was his source, yeah. and this came to Henry Peterson. Now, Henry Peterson's an old hand over there, as you know, and uh, bless his soul, he's a valuable man to us. Yeah. Uh, what did he say? Uh, he said that he wouldn't put a pass belt. But uh, the other thing, I was talking to Quinnies about this when I was over there, he said, if felt is the source, and if we get felt uh, way out of joint, we are in serious trouble. Because he knows so much. He knows so much. What's he know? I don't know. I didn't ask for specifics. With uh, he said one thing, he could he could not. Do you know about the Sullivan stuff? Yes, he knows about that. I called Felt, asked him what he knew about it, and he was, for example, very cool when I, I said, "There's a Time magazine story running, Mark, uh, in '68 or, or in '69 or '70 yeah. and so on and so forth." And he said, uh, "I said true or false?" And he said true. I said, "How do you know that?" I said, "I've never heard of that before." He said, well, if you talk to Bill Sullivan, he'll tell you all about it. And he gave me sort of a general, painted a general picture about it. Uh, but just cool as a cucumber about it. Uh, and what does he say about the denying it? How is he going to stand up for the denying He says, John, he said, uh, I said, well, first of all, I don't, I don't believe this could happen. I was protecting us as far as yeah, doubting what he said. He said, well, John, as far as I'm concerned, our, our phone call is totally off the record. We never had it. So that's a good one to watch just right there. <coughs>
this sort of thing continues once he gets through his confirmation. I don't know why he couldn't himself say, I'm going to take a lie detector test, and I'm going to ask everybody in my immediate shop to take one, and then we're going to go out and ask some of the other agents to take them. Yes, the leakage. the leakage. Because this, this only hurts uh, this whole institution. Absolutely. I think that's right. Yeah. That's right. He, I'm not talking about this here. Fine. 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 